Now here in 1 John 3, we're going to begin with a whole new section in this epistle. We're just going to look at these first two verses here in 1 John and address a subject that, gosh, I, I love. It just encourages me to no end. And it is a subject that, that John is, is really taking a little time out, a little, little uh, parenthesis here in this, this study. He, is, he left us in chapter 2, verse 29, with the idea of us being born of God, becoming children of God, and the proof that we are truly his kids is proven by the fact that we practice righteousness and that there is an action that takes place in our life. And yet John stops here for a minute and he just thinks about this whole concept, this whole idea that we could become the children of God. And he is struck by this fact. And he wants to point his readers and all of us here this morning. He wants to focus our attention on this particular subject. Now, why would the Lord love us? Why would he reach out and save us and transform our lives? Why would he send Jesus to die for a world that could care less about him? Well, John here focuses our attention on that subject. Verse 1, he says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, as I said to you a moment ago, John here is struck by this truth, that God would love us. And that is the reason why we could be called his children. That's the reason why he sent Jesus to die in our place. It's because he loves us. But it is such a love, and in a manner that is so beyond our comprehension, and John just wants to stop every one of us and make us think about that for a minute. Now, many times I think that when I talk with people, as you do, the question comes up of God's love. You see, you look at the world today and you see some of the, the evil or the harsh realities of, of life. Or sometimes tragedy comes into a person's life. And at the break table at your job, or your next, next door neighbor, or someone says to you, well, if God was a, such a God of love, why did he let this happen? You've been asked that question many times, probably. Well, what is your response? How do you respond to that particular question? Do you have a, an answer that's right on the tip of your tongue that you're ready with? Because if not, you, you will miss a tremendous opportunity to explain an, an issue, a question that people struggle with in this world. And you have to have an answer for it. Because the, it's the same reason that John is, is stopping to say, Behold, this is the manner of love. Stop and behold this. Look at it. Because when you stop and behold the love of God, you, you get an answer to that question and you get a balance in your life. Because it's so easy for people to get their eyes off of the love of God and on to the tragedy, on to the problem, on to the difficulty that, that is going on in their individual life. And so we need to refocus on the love of God. And that's what John is doing here. And you need to answer that question and help a person to refocus on the manner of love that God has towards them. Now, when people ask me that question, this is the way I respond to them. I explain, this world is in rebellion against God. God loves mankind. He loves everyone on this planet. 
But this world is in rebellion against him. And God's love will never force anyone to do what he wants. And I usually try and parallel it with a difficulty that a friendship or a relationship that you might have. And just remind them, look, have you ever had a, a teenager rebel against you? Have you ever had a friend that you tried to encourage to take some action and they, they rebel against your love towards them? Can you make them love you in response? And the answer is obviously no, you can't. You can't force someone to respond in love. Nor will the Lord force anyone. You see, the issue is, is that love is always a voluntary thing. In Hosea chapter 14, verse 4, there the Lord says concerning his backslidden, rebellious people, he said, I will love them freely. Now the word freely there means voluntarily. Love is a voluntary thing. It cannot be forced. And God will not force this world to respond to him or be obedient to his commands. He will encourage. Yes, he will send his people, but he will not force someone. No more than you can force someone to love you in return. And so it's a very simple illustration. And you have to focus people's minds and hearts on this truth. Now the word here, behold, is a very important word because it means literally to see or to perceive. And so John is saying, see this. See this love. I mean, perceive the love that God has towards you. And yet he will describe this, this free will of man here at the end of verse 1, where he says, Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Have you ever questioned in your mind when you're loving somebody and you're saying, why don't they see how much I love them? Why can't they perceive this? Why don't they get it? And it's the same reason why people didn't get it when Jesus was here. Notice he parallels this. The world does not know us because it did not know him. They didn't get it when he was standing right in front of them and watching his life day in and day out. They still didn't get it. And you will love people and you will reach out to them over and over again. And it becomes very frustrating, doesn't it? And it, it, it burdens your heart. But it is the same reason why they did not perceive his love. And so this is why we need to perceive it and then live it. Because some will respond, even as some responded to him. And so be that example of his love. But you need to focus. You need to behold the love of God. Because it's real easy for you to get your eyes off of his love as well. The world doesn't get it, but sometimes even as Christians, we don't get it. We miss the point, and our eyes get focused on the problem, the trials, the tragedies, the difficulties, and we begin to question his love just like the world does. And so behold his love. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, this is where the apostle focused the believers of that time. He focused them. They were going through tremendous trials and difficulties. They had lost many of their possessions. They had been ostracized as they became Christians from their family and friends. And there the apostle says in Hebrews 12, verse 2, he says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Now notice that he says, look to him. Get your eyes on him. Look at what he suffered and how he endured in love. And so keep your eyes focused there. And that's what every single one of us needs to do. 
if you've been looking at the, the tragedies, the evil of this world in this past week, and you've been getting discouraged, look to him. He has endured. He's endured much more than we have ever even thought about. Now, this love is where, where we need to focus our attention. Now, notice the next little phrase here. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. The manner of love. Now, this is the second thing that John is so, so, has such an imperative thing in his heart. He wants us to look at the manner of God's love. He wants us to focus on God's love, but the manner of its, his love towards us. Now, this, I believe, is so important because the word manner means quality. It's a quality of love. A quality of love that is beyond our comprehension, our ability to really comprehend it. And yet, I'm going to try and help you to comprehend it by several illustrations this morning. Because God wants us to see his love is totally different from anybody's love on this earth. It is an essential thing to focus and behold and perceive the manner of love wherewith God has loved you. Now, this manner of love is unlike anything you've ever seen, unlike anyone that has ever loved you, and unlike anyone who would ever love you. There is nobody on this planet not even the person who cares about you the most that will love you like this. In Micah chapter 7, verse 18, Micah said, Who is a God like you? And he's trying to compare God with somebody he knows. And he can't find anybody to compare him with. He says, Who pardons iniquity passing over the transgression of his heritage, who does not retain his anger forever, but he delights in mercy. I mean, this is the question that you will find throughout the scripture. There were many such passages that asked the, this question, that the prophets of old or the apostles in, in the New Testament ask, who is a God like you? I had difficulty trying to figure out which one I was going to use in this text. But this is probably the most interesting one because it shows that God pardons. He passes over transgressions. He does not retain his anger. And he delights in mercy. He delights in it. Many times we delight in revenge. We delight in taking our pound of flesh when somebody does us wrong. But the scripture says here, he delights in mercy. Now let me give you four different ways that the quality of God's love is so totally different from the way you love, the way anyone has ever loved you. The first is that God's love is sacrificial and it is beyond anything that we would ever do. In Romans chapter 5 verses 6 through 8, there Paul addresses this. He said, For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. And then he comes to this conclusion. He says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet, he said, perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. There are a few people that will die for a good man. But God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were sinners, still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, what a total contrast is that. I mean, would you want to die for someone who is screaming obscenities at you, uh, spitting on you, angry with you, shaking their fist at you? Would you say, oh, man, I just I want to die for that person? <laughs> I mean, you absolutely would not. You'd say, I'm out of here. You don't want what I have? I'm out of here. I'm gone. And that is the way we would respond. But he has loved you beyond anything that you have ever seen 
anything that is ever in anyone who has ever loved you. Secondly, his love is incredibly gracious and kind, even when you are ungrateful and unthankful. In Luke 6.35, there as Jesus is teaching his disciples how to love, he says this, he says, love your enemies, do good, lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be the sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Now notice how he makes that contrast again. This is the way God is, and this is the way he wants us to be. But again, that is very unlike our attitude. We have somebody who is unkind, and you just, you want to run. You want out of there. Someone who is unthankful, you don't want to love them. You don't want to reach out to them. And it is only divine love that enables you to do that. That's it. That's the only place it comes from. Because you don't have it inside, I don't have it inside. It's not there. His love is so totally different because he is kind to the unthankful and the evil. Gracious and kind. Now thirdly, his love is enduring. His love is so enduring, it begins in eternity past. And it proceeds to eternity future. That's what the scripture teaches. It says in Jeremiah 31, 3, God said to his people, I have loved you with an everlasting love. And with loving kindness, he said, I have drawn you. So he has had this love from everlasting. That is the strongest Hebrew word. It literally means beyond the vanishing point in your thought process. You can't think that far back. That's how long God has loved me and how long he has loved you. And yet, the scripture says that he will love those that respond to him from to eternity future. In Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 7, he says, God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. For by grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. For what reason? Why does he take us to heaven? He said that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. See, heaven is not just a destination. It's a place where you're going to continue to experience the kindness and the love of God for eternity. Now, the only, where, the only place where his love ends is at the judgment seat. And that ends for those that will refuse his love. So there is an end, but it's at the end of this age. Until then, he is continuing to love and draw all men unto himself. But there is an end to that love. You know, many times without this balance, people think, oh, well, God loves me no matter what I do or where I go or how I live. And it's okay. I can do whatever I please because God loves me that much. No, that's not correct. He does love you that much, but there is an end to that love. That is why there is judgment. There is a judgment seat that those who reject his love must stand before. And that's the other side of love. Love is a perfect balance of justice and mercy and is an essential truth. Now, fourth and last, his love is all-encompassing. In other words, there is not one person that lives on this planet that he does not love. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish. Now there's the qualifier. You have to choose to believe 
And when you do, then you will not perish, but have everlasting life. And so, in other words, he loves everybody. His love is so wide. Now, I guarantee you, I'll bet you every one of us in this room has difficulty loving somebody. Somebody that we struggle with that's hard to love. They're just obnoxious. They are difficult. They have an attitude. And you struggle loving them. But I'll tell you, and there's some maybe that you've even X'd off your list and said, I don't, I don't want to have anything to do with that person anymore. But you know, God's love is still reaching out to that person, even when I've X'd him off my list. His love is all-encompassing. He loves even the most evil people in this world. And you should pray for him, that God would break their hearts to respond to his love. Now, I want you to do one thing this morning. I want you to compare that kind of love with the way you love. Compare God's love, his manner of love, to the way you love. I've just been doing it as I went through each of these points. But think about it. Think about it personally in respect to your own life. How do you love? You see, God has loved and reached out and touched your life even when your heart was hard and you were unresponsive to him and unwilling to receive from him, he kept at you and he persevered until you got to that place where you would stop and say, okay, I, I yield, I give, I surrender. And that is the way God has reached out to love every single one of us. And we need, to, we need to behold it. We need to perceive that love because it, it changes the way we respond. I'd like to illustrate it to you in a little different way because I think this would, will bring the, the truth across. Would you go into one of the slums of our cities here in the United States or maybe some other country? Would you find some little orphan boy or girl that is living on the streets, that dirty, vile, it, you come up to them, they start screaming obscenities at you. They spit at you. You reach out to them, they say, get away from me. Would you take that child and take that child home, adopt them? and give them all of the privileges of your natural-born children and love them equally? Would you ever do such a thing as that? I mean, you, you'd say, well, no, I, you know, hey, if they don't want to receive it, they don't want my help, then forget it. But you are that child, you see. You are that orphan. You are the one who was rebellious, corrupt, resentful, bitter, hard, and yet the Lord reached out and he got a hold of you. And he re reached into your heart and he, he started tugging and you responded. You received it. And he's changing you even to this very day. In Psalms 113 verses 5 through 8, here again David said, Who is like the Lord our God? who dwells on high, who humbles himself to behold the things that are in the heavens and in the earth. He raises the poor out of the dust, and he lifts the needy out of the ash heap, that he may seat him with princes. You see, that's you. That's me. He's taken us from the ash heap, and he's seated us with princes. It's an awesome thing, but that is is how David saw his own life. David saw himself that way, as, a, as one who had received from a God that was unlike anything he had ever seen or known. Now thirdly, John wants us to behold the love of God for this reason. He wants us to see what we are 
and what the love of God has caused us to become. And he states it here as children of God. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Now, in the majority of the translations of the scripture, there is a little phrase that is inserted here which should be correctly placed there. It is, and such we are. If you look at your translation, if you have it there, that is the best translation of this particular text. In the New King James Version, it does not have it, and a couple of others. But the majority of translations, such as the NIV or the NAS or the International Standard Version, uh, these are major versions of the scripture. They all have it. Because that is what the Greek text declares. This is, should be there. So read it this way. He says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God, and such we are. We aren't just called children, or we will become children of God some day down the road. We are, and such we are. Now, if any of you struggle with that, the very next verse actually states that. In verse 2, he says, Beloved, now we are the children of God. And so John's point here is to say this is the, the desire of God's love. This is the purpose that God has bestowed his love on you, is to make you his child. And such you are right now, today. If you've received Christ into your life, you are his child. It says in John 1.12, To as many as received him, he gave the right, the authority, the power to become children of God. And so if you've received him, you are one of his. And you are one of his right now. And so John is here stressing this fact. He's just saying, look at what you are right now, today. You are his child. And so surrender to his love and the rest of what he wants to do in your life. Now, I think that John is stressing this fact here of God's love because he wants us to see it is totally different from any other person that has ever loved us or will ever love us. Because it is so unlike man's natural love. He stresses this fact again at the end there of verse 1. When he says the world does not know us because it did not know him. We've already looked at this. But you know the, the important thing that for every one of you is. You know don't look to this world for the love that only God will give you. Don't look for in a person for love that you will never get from them. And I find that people do this in marriage. I find that people do this in friendships where they're trying to get something more out of that person than they are ever capable of giving. There's only one person that will love you like this. And it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And a person can't give you this. When you realize that, you start looking to the right person to give you this love. And then you have something to give someone else. And this is not just a play on words. It is a reality. You need to only look to him for this love. Jesus said in John 5, 44, he said to his disciples, how can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from God only? You see, there is a real difficulty we have in believing when we're trying to get something from another person that only God can give us. You will stumble in your faith. I guarantee it'll happen. Don't look to receive something from a person that only God can give you. If you do, you will not continue to believe. 
because you will get angry. You will be resentful. So be careful. Now, this last item here in verse 2, what is the ultimate intention of God's love in your life? He says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, the basic truth here is that God wants to make you like himself. That is God's ultimate intention, the intention of his love. It is why he bestowed his love upon you, is so that he could make you like himself. Now, this, I believe, is so important because every one of us needs to see where we are headed. What is the goal? The goal is to become like him. My goal is not to become like some person. It's not to be like, you know, my mentor. You know, people always are saying, oh, you know, follow your mentor. And, and this whole concept today is, is really fixing people's in attention on another person. Yes, we have examples. Yes, we have people that, you know, we appreciate and what they've done. But I'll tell you, there's, there's one person I want to be like, and that is I want to be like him. And that is God's ultimate intention for your life. So again, don't misplace your faith and put it in a, an individual. Put it in the only one you can become like. Okay, In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, there in the beginning, God created man in his own image. Now, that is God's original intention, but obviously men have fallen and rebelled against him. And little of the image of God is left. Only by coming to Christ do we experience that transformation back in to the image of Christ, into the image that God intended for us. Now, how does that happen? I think this is an important truth. How does it happen? He says, well, the scripture tells us there's three basic ways that it happens. It first occurs when you receive Christ after asking for forgiveness he comes to live inside you, and he gives you a new nature. It says in Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 4, there Peter says that God has given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. Now this is how that image of God begins to take hold in our lives. We need a new nature. You see, we have an old nature. That old man inside us, as the scripture describes, needs to be put to death. I can't reform my old man. He needs to die. And the Holy Spirit makes him die. And I need to yield to this new man. And he gives me the character, the heart, the love, the same quality of love that God has loved me with. And now, it, that's the only way it comes out of you towards somebody else. It's the only way it happens. I first have to be born again. I have to be born from above. I have to receive him into my life. And then, and only then, that new nature comes to dwell inside me, which enables me to be transformed. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, this is how it takes place. He says, We all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now notice the words there. Transformed into the same image. You see, there is the original intention of God. And yet, note here, he said it happens by the Spirit. That's the only way it occurs. In Galatians chapter 
5, verse 16, it says, Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. That's the only way. You have to live under the control of God's Spirit. Now, this is God's predestined plan for you. Think about this. In Romans chapter 8, verse 29, it says, Whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, think about this. He has predestined you to be conformed into the image of his Son. That same image, that is what God intends for you. And he has predestined this plan. And he is working it out by his spirit inside you, energizing that new man that is inside you to become a different man. Now, in Philippians 1.6, it says that we are confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. The completion date on this work that God is doing is the day of Jesus Christ. It's not going to happen before that. We're not going to become sinless or perfect in this flesh. It is going to be accomplished on that day. But he is, he is working this work, and we should be confident that he's working this work every single day. If you want that work to take place, if you don't see a lot happening and a lot being transformed inside, you need more of the Holy Spirit. That's the bottom line. You need to cry out and say, God, fill me with your spirit. Make this old guy inside of me to die and empower this new man that's inside of me to live and to love others the way you intend. And when you do that, you know what happens? You change. You are transformed. Now one day, he says, the completed work will occur. It says in Philippians 3.21, he says one day he will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Now the Lord is able to subdue all things to himself. And the proof of that is one day if you live until the Lord returns, the scripture says, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, you shall be changed. You're going to be changed. And your body will be fashioned like his glorious body. And if you die, well, to be absent from your body is to be present with the Lord. You will stand in his presence and he will give you that new body at that moment. Now, what that's going to be like is very difficult to understand. In fact, John acknowledges that here in this text. He said, it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. In other words, he's saying, you know, I don't quite understand everything about what we're going to look like, what we're going to actually do. The scripture just says we're going to be with him. And John says, but what I do know is we're going to be like him. Because when I see him face to face, I'm going to be just like him. He said, that's all you need to know. I don't think our finite mind could truly fathom it. And so the Lord does not give us any more information than that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, there Paul said, while we're in this body, he said, we know in part. He said, we see through a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And so today we know just a part, a little bit. We don't know everything, but what I do know is I'm going to be just like him. You're going to be just like him. And your body is going to be fashioned just like his glorious body. What a, what a glorious thing that's going to be. David said in Psalm 17, 15, he said, As for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied 
when I awake in your likeness. I'll tell you, I can hardly wait for that day when I will awake in his likeness, when I will have that complete transformation finished, completed. Then I will be completely satisfied. Until that time, I need to yield to the Holy Spirit because there is where my thirst is satisfied. My hunger is filled. And that's why the Holy Spirit is so important for you to know in a real and a personal way in your life. Don't miss the life and the satisfaction that He gives by way of His Spirit. That transformation will carry on and will occur as you yield to Him. Amen? Let's pray together.